Welcome back, everybody. This is Rodrigo Fondador with another episode of Astral Real Estate News. Uh, really excited about our guest today uh, visiting us here in Asheville. Uh, we're going to get into that real quickly. As always, uh, just a reminder that this episode and all of our episodes here at Asheville Real Estate News are brought to you all by American IRA. Uh, they're your local IRA custodian. Uh, on that note, we're also having the founder, uh, Jim Hitt, joining us for our meetup at the end of uh, October. So November 29th uh, over at the old Habitat Brewing, which is October. the new architect. October, sorry, yes, thank you, Nola. October 29th uh, at the uh, at the new Archetype Brewing uh, location on Broadway. We're going to be talking about uh, creative financing, how to uh, max out your IRA, and house hacking. So really excited about that one. Hope to see everybody there. On that note, though, we are talking about the creativity side of the business today. Uh, the slogan or the kind of the what we're going to structure everything around today is the concept of what box. And I'm not going to explain this, uh, but without further ado, I'm going to welcome Bill onto the show and allow us to uh, explain what the shirt means and what that concept came from and why it's important today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, my, my pleasure. I um, pre- appreciate you inviting me here, and good meeting you, Nolan. Um, yeah. You know, thank y'all very much for having me here. Absolutely. Uh, what box, where it came from is a long, long time ago, like 2002, 2003, I was a baby real estate investor. Been mm-hmm. investing for maybe about seven years. So I kind of thought I knew what mm-hmm. was to do, and I was dangerous because I had some skills at hand <laughs> that I thought were just phenomenal. Anyway, there was a, a, a knocked on a door, house was vacant, and talking to the neighbors found out the mom and dad had died. And it was an estate situation. And so I put together an offer. I got in contact with one of the kids. They were handling the estate. And I put together an offer that would, I talked to each kid, what do they want? Put together an offer, but my offer had nine moving parts. And with nine moving parts, that was gonna be a confusing offer. And I knew that in doing this, the kids would be more worried about what the other person's getting and what they're not getting. And th- there's an old saying that a confused mind says no. no. And so I knew I was going to get turned down on this deal, though the offer was just a work of art. Mm-hmm. So I called up Pete Fortunato. And Pete Fortunato, for those of you that don't know, is this he, he's the best creative deal structurer on the planet. He's phenomenal. He's been my teacher since 1999. Just, just an incredible guy. <laughs> he's a savant when it comes down to deal structuring, and it's all he ever thinks about. There's not... There's not another topic he's going to cover. If you're with him, that's it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so I sent my all, I sent down the situation to Pete. He looked at it. 30 minutes later, he said, here's what you should do instead. Let's do this offer. And he went from nine moving parts to two. Mm-hmm. I presented the offer. It got accepted. We did the deal. And at the time, for about 13 years, I wrote a weekly newspaper column uh, that was syndicated throughout Georgia. Uh, it was a re- and it was, in this particular case, I titled that column, Pete Fortunato, the greatest outside the box thinker. And that was important because we're all taught how important it is to always think outside the box. We mm-hmm. hear it every day. Right. And so I was very proud of myself because that was outside the box thinking. And this, yeah. this thing he put together was outside the box thinking. Anyway, so it ran in the paper. I cut it out, put it on a plaque. I mailed it down to him. And about three days later, I get an email from Pete. Now remember the title of the column, Pete Fortunato, the greatest outside the box thinker. He sends me a two-word email, and all it says is, "What box?" <laughs> bingo. And Pete has ability. He's he's why I say something in a thousand words mm-hmm. when you can say it in three. That's just how Pete thinks. Mm-hmm. And I sat at my fire pit. We had a horse ranch. And I sat at the fire pit, just making notes for about three days. I didn't leave. Mm-hmm. And what that meant, because I knew that that was really important. And I ended up getting in my car and driving down to Madeira Beach and spent some time with Pete, spent the day with him. So I fully understood. And basically what he said was, for you to reach your full potential as a creative deal structure, you have to understand there can be no box. Mm -hmm. Because if you think there is a box, then you're gonna be chained to that. You're gonna drag it with you wherever you go. So the people that have the biggest problems with the box who are realtors, attorneys, because they can describe the box to you, what the lining's like, what the hinge is, latches are like, lids like, Right. They've spent and a lot of time educating themselves they are the on box. every component of, yeah. of the so, box. Right? And, and when I'm working with them, those kind of people, they're almost impossible to get 
to make them break free of the box because they're anyway so this thing was really important and then i spent the next bunch of years you know learning from pete and mm-hmm. dykes and, and jack uh, jack miller and understanding fully that there could be no box mm-hmm. because really the only rule is do no harm right our job is to help people get to a position they like better mm-hmm. so our job is not to buy sell or rent houses our job is to help people solve their real estate problems mm-hmm. and if we do that we'll do well and so that is the lesson I learned from Pete, and it's been the most important lesson I've ever learned in real estate investing. And, and Simply what box. How long ago was that? It was, was like that? 2002, 2003. So almost, not quite, but just about 20 years now. Yeah. So 15. Yeah, oh, yeah 15. Sorry. 15, 14. So, so let's take a step back. Uh, you said at this moment you'd been in real estate for about seven years when you had this uh, aha moment, right? How did you get into real estate? What were you doing before then? And uh, what did you start doing when you got into real estate? Okay. Uh, the best way to answer this question, I don't like to, I was born, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> I put myself through college selling electrolux vacuums door to door. And then when I graduated, I had a choice of going to Procter & Gamble. And this was like 1982, 1983. Mm-hmm. And they gave, I got a job offer at 32000 a year. And that was a lot of money. Right. And they gave it to me because instead of being in a fraternity or in this group or that group, I had sold vacuums for, right. yeah, I've been selling vacuums door to door to put myself through school. So I was a proven commodity. Mm-hmm. And um, I also could stay with Electrolux, and I would have made ninety thousand. The, the chance to make ninety thousand in my first year because it's straight commission. Right. And so I just stayed with Electrolux. So when I'm 24, and I was out knocking doors one day, and I came across a man who was home. And back then, men were never home; they worked. Mm-hmm. You know, there were women home, right. but men were not home. Hmm. And so that was unusual. And he let me come in and do my demonstration, and I found out. And I was like, why are you home? What do you do? And he owns 17 single family rentals. Hmm. And we talked about that. And I was in his house probably for about three hours. Forget the demo. Yeah, you're like, wait, what, what was what that? Do you do? How do you do that? <laughs> and it just fascinated me because I never had met anybody who had done that. Right. And I think I had just recently read or about that same time read a book by Robert Allen called uh, uh, Nothing Down in the 80s. Mm-hmm. It was how to buy a house with nothing down. So I was interested in it, and I talked to people about their houses because I'm a door knocker anyway. I was out there, right. so if I saw a for sale sign, I would ask, mm-hmm. you know, what are you going to do with this house? Why are you selling? How much? Just, but not to buy it, just curious. Right. Um, and I decided when I decided I wanted to become a real estate investor, 24 years old, and my parents were like, "Look at the money you're making," because by now I was making really good, good money, money. Yeah. And mo- working my way up through the company, and they kind of had a plan for me, so. Why are you walking away from the plane? Yeah, why are you doing this? <laughs> you know, why, why are you, you know, you're walking away from way too much money. And in the end, it's, it's what I want to do, but everybody talked me out of it. And I didn't have enough belief in myself because everybody said, mm-hmm. you'll starve, you'll right. die. You know, you don't want rental properties. No mm-hmm. one ever pays rent. Is you know, you know, we know. We've never done it, but we know what that's like. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do it. And then when I was 27, 28, I retired out of Electrolux because I got – the job offered to be an area vice president. Mm-hmm. So I'm 27 years old, offered the job of an area vice president, only a small problem. I didn't want to do it. I was, I'd been doing this now for 10 years and I, that's not what I wanted to go right. do. So I went and took a realtor test because I wanted to be an investor. This had never gone away. And I passed the test, which was shocking. <laughs> and I went into a real estate office to say, I, I passed the test. And they said, you have to sit behind this desk and answer the phone for the next six months. And I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to sell houses. I don't want to sell I want to buy houses. No, no, that's not, that's not what we do here. And I went to two or three agencies, and they all kind of said the same thing. And so I moved to Paris. So I, I was there for about naturally, a year. of course. Yeah. Why'd you move to Paris? Have you ever been to Paris? Uh, once I, I was probably you know? small enough to, oh. or too small to like understand the the allure of it. I don't, I don't know. Eight years if, old. If, probably, if you're so. if you're an <laughs> unaged male. You want to be in Paris. It's, it's, it was, it's a great place to be. And so, so you're like, okay, this isn't what I expected. I'm going to Paris. To I, I, yeah, I retired out of and whatever, I, yeah. I just left. Okay. Anyway, um, so coming back into it, I, I, I just I didn't never had the confidence. But then when I met my wife, mm-hmm. we got we uh, got married in uh, on, in uh, 1995, mm-hmm. and Kim's parents had three or four rentals, mm-hmm. so they weren't big investors, but they had three or four rentals. Mm-hmm. And I told her you know, what my dream was. Mm-hmm. And she said, 
well, that's not, that's not hard to do. My parents had three rentals. We can go do this. So that was the first person who believed in me. So we, you know, I started part time. I got a job at Home Depot so I could learn how to fix things. I didn't know how to nail two boards together. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's kind of how we got started. But it was Kim who got it started, not me. She found the first house. Mm-hmm. She negotiated the first deal. She mm-hmm. went and did the first title search in the deeds room. She got the thing closed. She found the money. It was Kim. I was terrified. <laughs> so I was in the background. But once we got started and I started getting a little bit of confidence. That proof of concept started settling in. Yeah. And then I found three really, I found the three best teachers in the world. The first was Dykes Botter. Mm-hmm. So Dykes is the guy that I go to and learned how to protect myself. Right. So LLCs and trust and all that. And he's down in uh, Marietta, Georgia. Phenomenal guy. Um, his website is uh, assets101.com. Mm-hmm. And I still go to everything he yeah. teaches today. Then, and then he Dyke said, go see Jack Miller. Jack was in Tampa. And Jack was a renaissance man. There's nothing he couldn't do. In fact, everything you see today on TV, mm-hmm. the seminars, this podcast, mm-hmm. everything, traces his roots back to Jack Miller because he was the first guy who went out on the road and said, let me show you how to make homes. Um, let me show you how to make a living, you know, get investment living property, houses. single family houses. So Carlton Sheets who a lot of us went to back in the 80s yeah. and 90s. That was his student. Robert Allen, that book I had read, Nothing Down in the 80s, was his student. Hmm. So it was Jack that started all this off. So I learned from Jack. And then at Jack's class, there was a guy in the back of the room that whenever there was a break, 40 people gathered around. And that was Pete Fortunato. Hmm. So I happened to get three really good teachers early on and then went to everything they taught. And to this day, I still do. Jack passed in 09. Mm-hmm. So we lost him. But uh, you can still get his stuff. Um, that website is. Uh, well, if we Google it, I'm sure he's going to be easily found if you just Google Jack Miller, right? So. I'm old. I'm not a big Googler. <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody else who's Cat, listening ca- will be ca- able to. Ca- so. Cashflow cash Depot. Cashflow cash Depot. Depot. Okay. But he's just phenomenal. So I want to I want to kind of take a step back and, and, and mention a couple of, of three things uh, that that seemed really important. So twenty four to twenty seven, twenty four, you were like went wanted to go. You said nobody had belief in you, and you didn't have belief in yourself. Correct. And it sounds like the tipping point in that was when you got married with Kim. Yes. What was the? Do you remember anything specific about that moment when you're like, okay, let's go? And you kind of had internalize that belief that it was doable, possible? It, not so much a moment. It was more over a series of things. Uh, there was a guy named uh, uh, John Adams who had a, uh, a column in every Sunday's Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And I would go and get the paper every morning mm-hmm. and bring it back on Sundays. And we'd sit in the paper and re- you would sit in bed and read the paper. So you can say that our investing career mm-hmm. started in bed. <laughs> now that you say that, now I think about that. But I, but because I'm dyslexic, right, and I have a tough time reading and writing, mm-hmm. Kim would read it to me. Okay. And then John Adams also happened to have a radio show, so, so we listened listen to, that. to that. But it was really me, you know, it's this desire I always had, and I thought back to that guy who had the 17 houses way back when, mm-hmm. and I knew that this was something I could go do. Kim's family kind of already did it, but it was Kim all the way. It was mm-hmm. that belief that she had. She goes, it's not that hard. We've always had rental properties. We can go do this. Right. And we were in our mid-30s, and we were looking at our mid-50s and being done. Mm-hmm. And we had to do something, and I wasn't smart enough to do the stock market. Mm-hmm. So if you, can't, if you need to retire and you're not working for, like, Ford Motor Company right. or if you're not working for the government. If you got to take matters into your own yes. hands, then... And so it was, how do we do this? And we thought if we could get 10 paid for rental properties by mm-hmm. the time we were 55 years old, yeah. that was the goal, we would be done because that'd be a thousand dollars a month coming in in rent. Yep. So that'd be $10,000 a month, take off six or 4,000 for expenses. Yeah. So you're that would leave us with $4,000 and we could live on that the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. And the other thing you mentioned is confidence, right? So you had your belief. When did your confidence really, really settle in? I know you mentioned Kim got kicked the door down, dragged you through it. But at a certain point in time, that was internalized, obviously, because now you're teaching and you're you know pushing the envelope on what's doable on the creative side of things. And I know like your big thing is door knocking. I mean, that doesn't happen without having a ton of confidence. Do you remember how many deals it took or at what point? It was just like the, be, the, the best answer. It wasn't a number of deals. It wasn't like I just arrived at a right. point. So Kim and I have a website. It's called BillingKimCook.com. Mm-hmm. 
But if you go there, you'll see a button that says about Bill and Kim. So you'll see our okay. bio. Yeah. No one gives a damn about our bio. Forget <laughs> that. But if you go below that, you're going to see our timeline. Okay. So each time I learned a new structure, mm-hmm. you'll see the date uh, oh, on the really timeline, cool. the date, what I learned, and what I felt like when I was learning that. And you'll see at every new structure, I was terrified. Mm-hmm. I was scared I was doing it wrong. I wasn't sure of the paperwork. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's going to really say yes to this. So like the first subject to deal. Mm-hmm. I think I, we did our first sub to deal in 98. Yeah. No one, no one is going to sell you their house and let you, their mortgage stay in place. And I just, but once we tried it. Mm-hmm. So if you go to that timeline, that answers the question. But I was probably, you know, the 10, do you know what the 10,000 hour rule is? Uh, loosely, right? In, th- in theory, it's 10,000 hours to become an expert or proficient in it, right? Yeah. So And so that basically is what it was with me. So after I paid the price, mm-hmm. after I had done it for you know my 10,000 hours or my 10,000 written offers, right. once I had done that, there was a line you crossed that all of a sudden, when you sit down with a seller, you're not thinking anymore about what will I do or what type of deal right. structures. You're listening to them. You're totally focused on them. You're only focused on their problem. Mm-hmm. And ha- you know, then, then you're not trying to think solutions yet. You're trying to dig at the problem. Right. And then once you have it all laid out, so I use a T-bar to lay it out. Mm-hmm. So once I have their problem laid out, only then do I look at it. And in what they tell me, they tell me how to structure it. Right. So I don't structure anything. The seller structures it for me because they say, this is what I need. This is what I can do. And you just guide it. Yeah, and, right? and so that was about ten thousand hours later, and we were okay. So that's where the that's where the yeah. that's where the you feel good about what you're doing, and you know that you're qualified to be at that table. Now it makes a lot of sense. I, I've said this before, I'm sure, on the podcast, but it is it, my biggest learning curve came when I had one of my coaches told me, um, I don't know, and this would have been maybe a year or two in. So let's say call it 2014 ish. He's like, you need to go look at 30 houses in 30 days. And I don't care if you think there you're going to put an offer on it or not. You just need to get comfortable with going through houses and talking to people. I did that, and my comfort level shot through the roof because you did so much in a compressed period of time that the same thing, you go through a house, and you're not focusing on the conversation or looking at the house. You can listen and take everything in because you're not overthinking anything and freaking out about what are you going to say next and whatnot. Here's a good question for you. What's that? So you're driving down the road. Yeah. You see a house for sale, realtor sign in the front yard, mm-hmm. right? You're interested in it. Right. What's the most important thing you see at that house? The most important thing, if I'm looking at that? Yeah. I would I would probably look at one of two things initially. I'm curious to know uh, if it matches up. I would be looking at uh, see if a mailbox, what the condition of the mailbox looks like. And I would be looking at what type of condition uh, gutters and or landscaping are in. And that's where almost everybody goes. Right. The answer is? The phone number? The seller. The seller? So the se- play the that most out impo- The most important thing you see. Yeah. At a seller's house is the seller. It's not the. It's not about the sticks and bricks. It's not about the house. Mm-hmm. It's about them and their problem. So when I go in, if right. they if they force me to go look at their house, I will. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to go look at their house. I just want to get to the kitchen table so I can ask my questions. So you know, as you pointed mm-hmm. out earlier, I'm a door knocker. Right. So when I'm in the yard and I'm talking to someone mm-hmm. at, at the door, I'm asking questions about the house mm-hmm. because I want them to invite me in and show me their house. Mm-hmm. But when I'm at the kitchen table. I don't ask any questions about the house. Right. I ask questions about them. Mm-hmm. Where does it hurt? And I always lead off with the same question every time. And it's Pete Fortunato's famous question, mm-hmm. which is why are you selling such a nice house like this? Mm-hmm. So if someone starts out and they said, you know, what do I do first? Where do I begin? Get to the kitchen table. Now, I don't care if you door knock, you send out flyers, you do bandit signs, you talk to real, I don't care what you do, mm-hmm. but you get to a seller's kitchen table and you get face to face and you begin with, why are you selling such a nice house like this? And you listen. You listen. And then as they say things, that will lead you to some other questions, and you ask those questions. Mm-hmm. But never, ever do you talk about yourself. It's not important. Mm-hmm. You talk to them. Find out about them. So I don't talk to people. I ask questions of people. It's mm-hmm. a good distinction as far as asking questions of people. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of different ways we can go here. I, I'm curious to know really kind of what your opinion is on 
how to survive the next downturn and why this could be important. Because, well, let, let, let's not over uh, create a lot of drama around. It might not be a downturn or whatnot. No, but there'll be a downturn. It, it's, it's, let's just call it a market cycle, right? We, you've, you've gone through, are you, maybe th- two, two for sure, right? Like three. Nine, not three. So, okay. So you've gone through three different market cycles where there's been a. Where there's significantly. Noticeable up and noticeable. down. Yeah. It's not, it's not like a little swing fluctuation. Right. Uh, this is. It's, it's bad. Everybody so, would agree that there is. Something yeah, around going two, up, around right? 2000, 99, 2000. Then there was a good one. Yeah. And then we had 2007 through 2012. That was the granddaddy. Yeah. And then the uh, next one to come. But those were my two. Yeah. Um, and there were some like little small ones in there also. We don't have to go super, you know, deep down this road, but what are the most important takeaways that you've had? Maybe just like two or three different takeaways that you had that really made a difference or that you think anybody who is getting, who hasn't, like for me, I haven't experienced one. What should I be keeping in mind? What are the things that you would tell me? Okay. So in 2007, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. we were just going into the downturn. We didn't know how bad it was going to be, but we knew something was afoot. Mm -hmm. So in 2006, everything leveled off. So it didn't go down, but values leveled off. So in five, they were skyrocketing. It's kind of like 2017, 18. Mm-hmm. So we're in 2019 now, and values have leveled off. Right. And a lot a lot of parts of the country did not start it down, but mm-hmm. we're leveling. Okay, so go to 2007. Um, we're starting to see a downturn. I had a RIA at the time, a Real Estate Investors Association group. And it was in Cartersville, Georgia. We had 2,400 members, um, published a 28-page newspaper, eight subgroups, I taught a monthly seminar. It was a big deal. And Pete came up t- to teach in Maria. It was in April 2007. And he was going to be doing a seminar in Atlanta. So he spoke in my group. And when we were at the house, we were talking. And he said, the one thing you should do, he said, because whatever's coming is going to be big. And it reminded him of what he saw during the savings and loan debacle back in 85, 86. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, Jack and I moved to Dallas, Texas. And we did more deals than you can possibly imagine because every, there used to be a sign outside Dallas that said, last person to leave, turn out the lights. That's how bad Dallas wow. got. Yeah. Uh, there was one time in Washington State, same thing. Hmm. It, it, there was a sign that said, last person to leave. Now look at it now. Yeah. So there, there's some really big downturns that can happen. Right. Uh, anyway, Pete said, if I were in your shoes, I would quit everything else you're doing and I would focus on the kitchen table, nothing but the kitchen table, because what we're going into, there will be no more banks lending money. And you're going to have to learn how to do deals without banks and working through people and gathering allies mm-hmm. and solving problems. And he said, but you'll come out of this meat grinder, a phenomenal creative deal structure. That night when we were driving home after the meeting, Kim was in the first car. I was in the second car. We had lots of equipment. Yeah. so. Two cars. And I looked, I called Kim up on the phone and I said, that was our last meeting. So we didn't announce it to anybody. We just closed down the RIA. Just like that. And I quit the golf club. I've been a pilot since I was 13 years old. Mm-hmm. So I quit flying. I quit, we quit going over, we quit everything. And the focus became the kitchen table. So when you go into a downturn, when things are getting tough, you have to really focus on helping people. Because our job is not to buy, sell, or rent houses. Our job mm-hmm. is to solve people's real estate problems. And in a downturn, there are a lot, a lot of problems. And when you're, when we, what we've been going through since 2012 has been an upturn. Yeah. Well, people don't have real estate problems like they, you know, very much. Everything yeah. is appreciation. So every real estate investor looks like a damn genius because you buy a house, you can wait two years, mm-hmm. sell it, and you make a lot of money. You know, it's just appreciation is going on right. really good. But when, when values are tanking and crashing, mm-hmm. especially like they did back in um, 7, 8, 9, 10, what do you do then? How do you solve those problems? Mm-hmm. You know, how do you fund those deals? And again, it's just going to the kitchen table and you're out there and you got to use your creativity. So my first advice is get to the kitchen table. Ignore everything else and get face to face with people mm-hmm. and listen to what they're saying to you and they'll give you ways to structure. But one of the structures that worked re- that work really, really good in a downturn is a master lease. Another one is using options. Mm-hmm. And almost no one uses options. Yeah. They may knew, they may know what a lease option is, but straight options, almost no one uses them. Yeah, there's uh options are interesting. Uh you know, they're like you said, there's just right now it's 
kind of everybody's t- pr- t- approaching things the same way. I'm sure you're seeing it a, a lot, right? It's just coming in cash offers. 60 cents on the dollar. Right? And then See, it, everything's the big damn hammer. Yeah, 60 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar. Mm-hmm. The stupid ones are doing 80 cents on the dollar. The smart ones are doing 40 cents on the dollar. <laughs> but that's that, that's the whole idea. It's kind of like if you mm-hmm. open up their creative deal structuring right. toolbox, there's one tool. The mm-hmm. big damn hammer. That's all that's in there. Right. And if you can't use the big damn hammer, well, and they can't do the deal. Right. And they're walking by so many different deals they could do if they just had some other tools in the box. Yeah. I, I, on that note, this is just a, a question. You know, what's the danger of uh, of being too spread out, if there is a danger at all, on having too many approaches and not being really good at any of them versus saying, hey, like, I'm going to buy, I'm going to really just get really familiar and master two or three creative options and just that's my bread and butter. Instead I think of, you almost have to in the beginning. So I had to go do a number of sub two deals yeah. before I felt comfortable. Again, go look at my timeline again. Yeah. So you'll see where I did one. But all of a sudden, you know when you buy a yellow Volkswagen and then when you drive around town? I, I, unfamiliar, but I'm following. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, all you see is yellow Volkswagens. <laughs> right. So as, some, as I was learning... When I was I trying to saying. do sub two deals, everything looked like a subject two deal. When I did my was started doing owner financing, buying with owner financing, everything looked yeah. like owner financing. When I started doing master leases, everything mm-hmm. looked like a master lease. Right. It wasn't till like in my ten thousand hours in till I had all these tools in the toolbox that I felt comfortable using mm-hmm. that I really started listening to the person and instead of trying to use the technique that I wanted to use, right. I used the technique that was best for the job. Right. But in the beginning Maybe flipping is the only way we know how to go. So you, you kind of get good at that or wholesale, right. you get good at that. And then keep adding to your ability to structure deals. Just keep stacking. <coughs> when I first got started, I didn't know there was any other option other than wholesaling to get started. And right now, uh, you know, wholesaling and flipping has been very popular. The TV shows, it's also- Every TV show. Quick cash. Do, do you notice on A&E, you don't see anything about how to be a landlord? Well, you know, of course not, because there's not, I mean, what, what would the show be? It'd be a lot of people getting gray hairs. I can sympathize with that. It's, But I think, uh, you know, personally, really big fan of rentals here. Um, we, we love mobile homes uh, specifically uh, as far as kind of niche. And we're doing some transition around that a little bit now. Uh, but what's your opinion on this? Like, what's the, is that a good way to get started? Would you recommend somebody approach things a little differently? Uh, what are your thoughts? When you say... My thoughts on as far as just getting started in like this this craze where it's like if you're doing real estate you should be flipping or wholesaling no, and go all in on that. If I could go back to when I was new, yeah, pretty the the answer is there's three different types of investors. You mm-hmm. have the starters, right? That's someone who's done five deals or less. So they're learning how to spell real estate investing. They're mm-hmm. learning how to fill out a purchase and sale agreement. They're learning how to go to a closing attorney. You know, basics, right? Then you have the estate builders. Now, estate builders are someone who understands you can flip and wholesale and make some cash, Mm -hmm. but it's not the best way to go. Because if you're you're looking at this thing with long-term glasses, you want to have some rental properties, you want to have some notes, you want to have some, you want to have something that's going to give you mailbox money. And flipping does not give you mailbox money. Wholesaling does not give you mailbox money. Talk about that more about that in a minute. Um, So, that's the estate builder. And then you have enders. So Kim and I are enders. We've been at this for 30 years. Mm-hmm. We have all the properties we want. We have notes. We have options. We have a mobile home park. So all our money comes in every month. We don't have to go labor for it anymore. The work was already done. And we were smart enough to keep these things. The best of the best, we kept. And it's a question of, do you want the slow nickel? Or do you want, I mean, do you want the slow nickel? Wait, saying that wrong. Do you want the fast nickel? Or do you want the slow dime? When you keep a home, that's going to be the slow dime. Mm-hmm. And to tell a story on this, when I was when Kim and I were newly married, mm-hmm. uh, been married less than a year, uh, we had a horse ranch, and uh, Kim's a big horse girl. Been you know training horses since she was five, five. So yeah. Anyway, she got me into it, and I got thrown from a horse, and I broke pretty bad, and I'm on a couch, not able to move for about a month and a half. At that time, I made my money by selling vacuums door to door working for Home Depot and training horses, but I couldn't move. So what happened to my income? It, it disappeared. It disappeared. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> I love the sound effects. I mean, this is great. <laughs> so um, my money disappeared. Right. 
and we were newly married. Now, it turns out we had some savings, but what if we hadn't? Yeah. We would have been in trouble. More importantly, what if I had broken my neck? Because mm-hmm. I landed on my head. Right. What if I had been a paraplegic, quadriplegic? That would have affected us for the rest of our lives. That would have been a very tough situation. Right. 22 years later, 2017, I had something called a pulmonary embolism. It's a big blood clot in your leg, mm-hmm. and it released. And it came up through a deep interior vein, went through my, it blew through my heart, and then it blew into my lungs, and it killed 30% of my lungs. Jeez. So I'm back on the same couch 22 years later. First question, why am I on the same couch? It was a great couch. No, I'm a landlord. <laughs> so all our money went into our houses. So our houses have granite countertops and LED lighting and really nice doors and high energy windows and brand new heat and air systems. Our house, the ranch house that we had, it had you know Formica countertops with loose Formica. So you know, da 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 you know, hit it. And so we had a couch that had holes all through it and worn out, but it was the same couch because we put our money into urine. our rental properties. Yeah, your income producing. And so I'm sitting on the same couch 22 years later, as proud as I can be, because the doctors had come to me and said, you should have died, it should have killed you. The blood clot should not have made it through your heart. The thing I was most proud of is now my income didn't come from earned, didn't come from earned income. Right. Didn't come from labored for income. It came from investment income. So it came from rental property, options, and notes. Mm-hmm. So if I, as I lay on the couch, what happened to my income? It kept Nothing. going up. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. If I had died, what would have happened to my income? Same thing. And that was the pride I took. Because as a man, as yeah. a husband, my generation, this is a very important thing. I had taken care of my wife. Mm-hmm. She would never worry about money ever again. But what if... We hadn't done the hard, made the hard decisions, and done the sacrifices. Right. The, we had made over those twenty-two years mm-hmm. to gather all these capital assets. Right. When did you feel that you could maybe enjoy the fruits of your labor a little bit? Because what two thousand fifteen. So that was twenty years. My time twenty. Okay. So I'm because I was thinking it's like I think that's one thing that. I know even like you, me, you know, being on the younger side of things uh, is that it's always like putting in the long room. Sometimes it, it's hard to let me rephrase this question. I think this uh, this way. What were you doing in the just through that process, if anything, to feel that you were on the right path, even though you were on the same couch and sometimes you were walking through properties that looked better than your own house that you were living in? I was hanging around. So let, let's go to when I'm 47 years old. Right. So this is um, 2007. So I, I was done 2015. Right. In 2007, I started spending a lot of my time. I'm 47 years old. I yeah. want to be done when I'm 55 years old. That was always the goal. Mm-hmm. And I started spending time with Enders. So if you go to the Madeira Beach McDonald's mm-hmm. in Florida, mm-hmm. Pete walks into the, that McDonald's every morning at 8 o'clock, mm-hmm. except on Thursdays, because that's the exchanger meeting. Okay. So he's at Denny's at the exchanger meeting. But he's at that McDonald's since 1983, 1984. He walks into that McDonald's. And a lot of old people, gray hair, bald heads, walk in there with him. So these are the best of the best because the mecca for real estate investing, our type of real estate yeah. investing, is Tampa and St. Pete, Florida. Right. That's where Jack was from. That's where Pete was from. That's where all this started. Because, again, there was nobody out there teaching this. Mm-hmm. This was not going to people. There were people that had rental property, but right. no one was out there teaching it. So this was where it started mm-hmm. back in the mid-'70s. But anyway, I asked, and I, I, I encourage everybody to, to, to ask these three questions. So I would get with the enders, mm-hmm. and I asked three questions. Number one, what did you do right? Second question, what did you do wrong? Mm-hmm. Third question, what didn't you do? Looking back, mm-hmm. what didn't you do that you wished you would have done? Because here's the thing I learned. These people were between 70 and 80 years old. And at their high water mark, they had 15 to 55 rentals. Mm -hmm. But now they have between five and 10 rentals. So what happened to the bulk of the rental property? They sold them owner financed? Yes, they sold them with owner finance because they got long-term capital gains treatment. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get rid of the house and turn it into cash, which is a stupid thing to do. Because if you get cash, you're gonna spend it on a shiny red thing that honks. Now that's stupid. Mm -hmm. What they did is they turned it into a note. 
and they would upgrade their notes as they went. Because you, once you have a note on a house, if you right. sell a house with owner financing and you take a note back, you're not locked into it. You right. can sell the note, you can trade the note for something you like better, you can use the note as collateral, you can keep the note and get the payments. Everybody Give thinks, the options, right. Yeah, everybody thinks I'm stuck to this thing. You're, you're not. Right. But they, they like their collateral behind the note. They don't want to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of notes, but they keep their best five to 10 rental properties. They don't get rid of those. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is notes run out. So if you have a 30 year AM, so it's let's say they, they, they were selling off in their 60s, that means in their by the time they hit 90, all those notes would have paid off. And that can be dangerous is to run out of money mm -hmm. when you're 90 years old when you need it the most. So instead they kept five to 10 of the houses because with those rental properties, you have the write offs of the rental, mm -hmm. you're able to raise rents as you go. And it's, a, it's not, you're not taxed as if you earn the money, it's investment money, mm -hmm. it's, it's rental money income, right. and that's a low taxed event, mm -hmm. and usually with the write-offs is a no taxed event. Right. You keep all you make. So <coughs> what did you do right? Good question. I think if I can narrow it down is when we were building up the empire, my goal was 25 written offers a week. And I knocked on the first door Monday morning, 9 a.m. And I would knock doors until 30 minutes before sunset. Mm -hmm. And my, I couldn't stop, meaning that week was not done until I made my 25th written offer. So I started the week by knocking doors. And I mm -hmm. wouldn't go do anything else. I wasn't going to work with a horse. I'm not going to take my wife on a date. I'm not going to go have lunch with my friends. I knocked doors. And I got to my 25th written offer. And only then did I go do the other stuff. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I did right was when I was 19 years old, I'm selling vacuums door to door and I'm having a really tough time because I'm not a salesman. I, I, I geared myself more towards service. Mm -hmm. I just linked that way. And I was having a really tough time my sophomore year and it looked like I wouldn't make enough money to go to college and I was going to have to drop out. And that really, you know, I really want to go to college. And my mother brought me home a cassette tape. A cassette tape is this little box and it has some tape in it and on it is words or music. Mm -hmm. And we used to put in a thing called a cassette player. You could stick it in and, and the little thing would go round and round and... Off it go. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and it was Zig Ziglar's audio book, See You at the Top. Mm -hmm. And... I've read that book. Yeah. yeah. So he sold pots and pans. Mm -hmm. I was selling vacuums. We're both door-to-door -door salesmen. Um, we're both from the South, so I understood yeah. the way he spoke. But on that tape, I heard him say, you'll get exactly what you want in life mm -hmm. if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. In other words, it's about them, not you. And that became my business mantra from that point forward in my life. So I think the two things I did right, number one is I went out and made written offers. Again, right. I don't care if you knock doors or you However do mailers. I, got, I made 25 written offers a week. Every week, that's 100 offers a month, that's 1,200 offers a year. That was the most important thing. So if you're doing 1,200 $1, offers a year, you're going to find between 12 and 15 deals, really good deals that year. Yeah. So Kim and I were never, we were never, you know, I'm sure that you do more deals in a year because, again, the value of your business and how you do things. You do more deals in a year than I've done in my entire life because we always did 10 to 15 deals a year and that was it. Mm -hmm. So we weren't trying to do 30 deals a month. Right. It's just we did it for 20 years, and we kept a lot of the properties that we did. Mm -hmm. And then we just kept breathing until they were paid off. Right. Simple. But real estate investing is a simple business. It's just not easy. Yeah, it's hard to execute. Because you got to go out every day right. and make those stinking written offers. So I got to add one more. The, the audio tapes. So. Yeah. Was it, what, yeah, what was the, can you expand on the audio tapes? Why was that something that you did? Right? It was just that one saying that, that, that okay. Pete said. It, it was that thing that was important. Gotcha. I heard him say, you'll get exactly what you want, want in life if you just help enough other people get what they okay. want. That lesson combined with me out knocking doors and understanding I'm not trying to buy, sell, or rent houses. Right. I'm trying to solve a, a problem. That was not me coming up with that. that I mean, I haven't been to that line, mm -hmm. but it was really uh, zigs, find people right. to help. That's all you do. And I just kept doing it and didn't quit. So that's the third factor is no there were a lot of walls that Kim and I hit, but yeah. we just didn't quit. We just kept going. What did you do wrong? Sold some really nice houses that I wish to God I hadn't have. 
<laughs> I feel like I hear that often when I if, talk to if, people if, who are in the, if the you final talk to, stretch if, if, of if their... If you talk to Enders, right, yeah. you will always hear almost the same thing. We sold too many of the good properties we should have kept. Right. But they needed the money. So here's a great, great example of that. There's a guy named Jack Fullerton. He's in California. Mm-hmm. Call him Coach. But just a phenomenal investor. He invests within a mile and a half of his house. Mm-hmm. He's got 35 properties, mile and a half of his house. And in 1982, Jack brought into an exchange meeting a contract that he was trying to sell off the contract. Mm-hmm. He needed $5,000 so he could put food on his table. Mm-hmm. He was short, and he needed some money to pay some bills and put food on the table. And nobody would give him 5000 The most he, The biggest offer he got was two. Mm-hmm. And it pissed him off. So he's like, you know, I'm, and he, he said, I'll just do this myself. I'll show you you should have taken this deal because mm-hmm. he's cantankerous. Yeah. Today, that property that he tried to get $5,000 for, cash flows in California, net, after everything, $2,400 a month. <laughs> so do 24 times 12 yeah. times all these years because it's been paid off now probably for 10 years. Right. <clears throat> and that house is now worth 1.4 million bucks. Wow. Hold on to the good ones. Hold on to the good ones. And ag- again, most of us that have been there, we can think back to a couple of those houses that were like a three bedroom, two bath, brick ranch, right. two car garage, non rental neighborhood, great churches, great shopping. And someone offered us a big check and we took the big check because we thought we needed it. Eyes got wide and it looks good. It's like, of course. What do you wish you would have done differently, if anything? Or what do you wish you would have done that you didn't do? One of the things I said, and I was wrong about this, was I wish I hadn't done the RIA. I wish I had, Kim and I hadn't started the RIA. And I felt that way for a long time because of the time suck. It slowed me down because my ego got in the way. You know, we had this thing and it was build this, build that. Yeah. I'm all that and a box of Cracker Jacks. And all of that, yeah. Be careful of that. But, and for a long time, I was like, I, I shouldn't have done that. I should have waited until I became financially free mm-hmm. and then looked Got at it. doing a RIA. That would have been a smart thing to do. But looking back now where I am now, so since 2015, I've been traveling around the country teaching. Mm-hmm. Almost all the friends I've made around the country had something to do with my RIA, meaning Pete Fortunato knew who I was because I brought him to teach my, to my RIA. Or I, people would hear about it, or they got my newspaper, or I'd meet them at Pete's, and you're this. It was a lead-in to other groups that set me apart from just a mm-hmm. normal Joe investor. And I would not be where I am right now if I had not had the RIA and would not know what I know if I hadn't been teaching all those years. That's a perfect segue <coughs> to, uh, you know, as we wrap things up a little bit here, let's let's talk about what you, what you are doing now, the teaching, and, and what's that look like? How do people get connected with you? And, you know, if they want to learn how to break apart the box and, and, and be able to say, it's like, I don't think about a box at all. Um, yeah, how do people connect with you and, and follow you and see where, where you're going to be at and everything? Unfortunately, okay. this is going to release uh, after your time here in oh, Nashville. Th- th- that's fine. That's but, fine. Um, so the best you thing go to do, other places. So yeah, the best thing to do is call me on the phone. Okay, I'm old. Okay, <laughs> okay. So this whole don't text me, don't email me, don't don't text me and say when can I call you. Just just so call my me. phone. My phone number seven seven zero eight one five eight seven two seven. I do not coach. I do not mentor because mm-hmm. I want my. I've worked too hard to get to where I am, yeah. and I don't want to be owned by anybody. But you but teach. It, yeah, I teach. So if someone has a question, call me. I don't charge for it. Just yeah. call me up. I help you structure a deal. And people always say, why would you do that? It's because I spent a lifetime honing my skills. Mm-hmm. My tools are very, very sharp. But if if I don't continually use the tools, they're going to get dull. Mm-hmm. Example of that is when I moved to America, I spoke Spanish fluently and I spoke Thai fluently. I did not speak a word of English. But by, this is I moved to the States when I was six. But by the time I was 13, I spoke English fluently, mm-hmm. but I did not speak Spanish or Thai anymore. So creative deal structuring is its own language, like Chinese. Mm-hmm. And to learn Chinese, people say it's hard. It's not, because there's, there's a billion five-year-olds who speak Chinese fluently, and their brains are not fully formed. So it cannot be hard to speak Chinese, but you have to be around it all the time. And in my case, when I was no longer around uh, Spanish and Thai, I lost the language. Mm-hmm. And I'm terrified that here I've worked 30 years to, to, to master this language. And I'm more than happy to help people because it keeps me sharp. It's kind of like playing a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. So I'm happy doing that. 
as far as traveling, yeah. um, my wife and I sold our horse ranch last year. We moved into a motorhome because when we were in our mid-30s, we said, when we hit our mid-50s, we want to be done so we can go travel. Mm-hmm. That was the whole idea. So in 19, uh, 2015, when that year ended, um, we were free to, you know, we had done everything. We had all the prior, everything we needed was done. You're and we were to go travel. And we had always had a, a fifth wheel or a, a horse trailer with living quarters or mm-hmm. we always traveled. It's just we got a motorhome and now I travel. And then in 2017, I was calling friends saying, I'm going to be in town. Um, can I see you? Because mm-hmm. we have friends all right. over the country. And they said, yeah, but as long as you're here, we have an investor group. Will you come come speak to the group? I didn't see this happening. Right. So now if you go to our website, the website's buildingkimcook.com. Go down to the bottom right hand side, you'll see all the places I'm teaching, and I teach differently than most. Mm-hmm. So usually when I go in somewhere, I'm not in a hotel, I'm in our motorhome. Mm-hmm. So we're there for usually 10, 14 days, something like that. And I'll teach at the main meeting of the RIA. And then a day or two after that, I take a group out door knocking. Mm-hmm. I take 30 investors door knocking because everybody thinks they know what door knocking is about. They think they know what's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to get shot, door stand in our face. All, All the that. good things, right? <laughs> but that's not what happens. So I take 30 people out door knocking, and um, when we go out, we may drive five miles, maybe. Mm-hmm. We'll make between five and ten written offers in a town I've never been in, mm-hmm. in a neighborhood I know nothing about. I don't Google. I don't get any information ahead of time. But I'll make between five and ten written offers. Eight out of ten, eight out of ten sellers will invite us in, the entire group. Eight out of ten. We'll invite 30 people into their house. Yes. So if I'm lying, yeah. obviously I couldn't have done this for the last two and a half years because everywhere I go, they say, he's a bald-faced liar. Yeah. But eight out of ten sellers invite us in. Um, I make between five and ten written offers, and here's the best thing. Uh, we find between one and three shadow sellers, meaning someone who's about to put their house on the market, they're not on anybody's radar, no competition, mm-hmm. no one knows about them, and their neighbors rat them out. Oh, Tom across the street, he's been talking about moving. You know, He's going to go down to Florida. And we find one to three of those shadow sellers, and so we walk over to their house, talk to them, and we make an offer to that house, too. And we're usually the first ones who do that. Hmm. <coughs> Any closing thoughts that you feel like maybe we haven't covered or something I should have asked yeah. you that I didn't? Yeah. Uh, I, I get questions all the time where people call me up and they're not making it. They're having a tough time. And I ask two questions, two questions only, and mm-hmm. I can narrow down the problem to what the problem is. First question I ask is, how many written offers have you made in the last 30 days? Mm -hmm. Guess what the answer normally is? Zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. Second question I ask is, how many written offers have you made in the last 12 months? And the answer is usually less than 10. So if I've got to go make 40 written offers to find one good doable deal, now that doesn't mean that people don't along, you know, in that 40 say, here, please take my house. Right. That doesn't mean it's a good deal. Some of the best deals you ever do are the ones you don't do. But for me to find something that I really like, that I really want, 40 written offers, and I'm good at what I do. So if someone's new and they don't have a lot of skills and they're only doing 10 offers a year and they're, they're upset because they, they haven't done 20 deals that year, are you kidding me? Yeah. So track the number of written offers you're making. And again, for me, I just door knocked. Yeah. And it was 25 written offers a week and I could have that done usually by Tuesday night, maybe sometime Wednesday. And that's why I take people out door knocking when I'm traveling because um, they have to, I want them to see I can make five or 10 written right. offers. It's not set up. I got to have one other thing. So I said about the door knocking date. The other thing I do is usually on that Saturday, I do a, a full day of deal structuring. So it's creative deal structuring and creative funding because everybody knows how to use the big damn hammer only. Well, what about all the deals are walking past? So I show how to do master leasing, how to use options, how to do owner carry, how to do sell with uh, sell with owner financing, mm-hmm. how to do a deed for note deal, how to do a sub two deal. So I'm able to show these deals that we've done so people can see there's different ways things can right. be structured. And hopefully it'll put them on the road to understanding to, to, this is what they need to learn about so they don't walk past deals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, offers is huge. That is... Uh I've always found that anytime I feel like I'm in a slump, it usually comes back to that too. Go make more offers. Yeah. It's, uh, I always heard, uh, one of my coaches, same coach told me to go on this house is if you prospect, you don't have to tolerate. I think that's what it was. So, uh, last question. What's the best place you visited in the last two and a half years, three years that you've been on the road? Four years, I guess. Every place. Every place. You don't yeah. have a particular favorite. No, I was an army brat. 
Okay, so mm-hmm. my dad traveled around the world, and I I, I loved where I was, mm-hmm. and I couldn't wait to get to where we were going. And so that's I've always had wanderlust. Hmm. And so a good thing, you know, here in Asheville, there's things to see here. We were just yeah. in Richmond. Before that, I was in Georgia. Before that, we were in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Earlier this year, I walked across the Mississippi River. Wow. Have you ever walked across the Mississippi River? How far north were you? That's, that's, that, and that's the question to ask. Yeah. That's the question almost nobody asked. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were in Minnesota. Ah, okay. And the Mississippi River is 20 feet wide and about two and a half feet deep. Wow, it's the cool. headwater. It's, mm-hmm. it's where it comes out of the lake. Right. That's the headwater. And right where you can walk across, about 20 yards south of that, is a the first bridge that goes across the Mississippi is a wooden log. Wow. Cool. And, you can, and, it, and it spans the entire Mississippi. That's cool. Good question. Most yeah. people never ask that question. <laughs> awesome. Well, Bill, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to hearing you talk this week here in Asheville and everything. So, um, all right, guys, there you had it. Uh, lots of nuggets on this one. Hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, uh, as always, please uh, just go to iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to this. Uh, Leave us a review. Give us a rating. Share this with your friends. It really means a lot to us uh, if you're able to do that. Thank you, and see you guys next week. Thanks, folks.